There's something coming towards me. It's here. It's coming down. It's coming out. With just a few feet of visibility, the only camera that picks it up is the one fixed to my tank. I'm right next to it. I'm right next to it. I'm with it. I'm hunting a man-eating river monster called a goonch. But the question is, how does a goonch become a supersized monster? There might be a grisly answer. Here, there is an unusual and regular supply of food. Human corpses. It is the Hindu custom to burn the dead on the banks of the river before consigning their remains to the waters. Pandit Kamlesh Vyas is a leading Hindu cleric and has personal experience of this practice. They'll burn the funeral pyre, and when the body is even half burned, they'll just push it away or just slide it into the river. Once the soul is gone, that means your body is just a, a thing, actually. So water creatures, they can use the body as their food. Is this fish getting fat on human remains? The theory that this monster has grown extra large on a diet of partially cremated corpses is something that the local people actually said to me. Sounds pretty gruesome, but of course, it's just perfectly natural behavior for a scavenger. The thing about these stories, though, is that this monster appears to have made this sinister quantum leap to feeding on living animals, including people. One thing people have said about this creature is that it is actually attracted by commotion on the riverbank, particularly the flames, vibration, uh, smells, everything associated with these riverside funerals. So I'm building a simulated uh, funeral pyre to try and call the creature in. That night, nothing stirs. But in the morning, it's in the fast water. Something very powerful. Try and relax and keep a bit calm. Gaining a tiny bit of line. Right, the water is flowing this way now. I've got it into the water that's flowing this way. Well, I have been fishing long enough that I've developed a kind of sixth sense. I know when I have a big fish on, and this is a big fish. It's gone, Chanel, it's gone. There's a lot of line out and some very strong water the other side of it, so... It's... The big problem here is that if it gets out of this pool, I am never going to be able to pull this fish back up against this current. Very, very touch and go, very touch and go. And then it does exactly what I didn't want it to do. Either this fish is gone, or I've got to do something drastic. I'm going to have to go for a swim. Wait till it comes up. Wait, 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 wait. Now, now, now. That is a serious size gunch. That is a man-sized animal. That is as big as a person. It's bigger than a lot of people around here. That is a big fish. They do exist, the gunch. They do exist. Six foot of muscle behind that mouth. And those teeth are just like shark teeth pointing back. If that got hold of you, there'd be no getting away. When I was diving with Rick, and we were seeing these, uh, these beasts under the water, and they just look so otherworldly. Is it a hallucination? Do these things 
really exist. And yes, the Gooch does exist. Just the absolute perfect predator. Huge mouth on there. Huge, huge, huge mouth. And uh, if anything just comes down within range of that mouth, it's too late. I mean, big as this fish is, um, the fish that is taking people would be bigger than this. I mean, it wouldn't actually need to be more than a couple of feet longer, but that would really give it a bit, bit more weight. I mean, it would probably weigh twice as much as this. And, you know, just the thought of that is quite terrifying. OK, uh, is it off the ground? No, yes. OK, 166, 161 pounds. The description given by Surendra Bora of the creature as an elongated pig easily corresponds with the smooth, scaleless back of the goonch. Kesar Singh's statement that he saw a black shape also matches. And the sucking force caused by the opening of a vast mouth that Jogar Singh talks about, that also matches. I think that what the eyewitnesses saw was not an elongated pig, not a mythical creature, the Seuss, but this, the giant devil catfish, a monster-sized gooch fattened upon human remains. Having heard a horrific account of a fish entering a man's penis, I manage not only to track down the victim, but I take him back to the actual scene of the assault on his manhood. OK, so it's 11 years ago. It's in this very spot. Silvio and some friends were in the water down there. He gave me a dose of milk. I went up when I was descending, I had to urinate. But then... And after a little period of time, Silvio you know, felt the need to urinate, you know, as, as, as happens. He knew the, the story about the candy roo, so he actually sort of took himself partially out of the water. While he was relieving himself, suddenly he said, you know, he just had a bit of a shock. And, you know, the first thing he knew was that the fish was already, you know, inside. Only, you know, just the end of its tail was out. Trying to grab hold of it, but it's a very smooth fish, a bit like a bar of soap. No good, you know, no success pulling it out. So basically just ran up onto the bank to try and get some help. E aí não deu jeito, tive que ir lá para o Manaus para ver se conseguia tirar. You know, the, the hospital facilities here aren't brilliant. Sylvia had to go to Manaus, which is quite a long journey away. It's several hours by road. And went to a hospital there. And basically, people just didn't believe him. You know, he, he was having in the situation of people just not believing that this was true. So was passed from one hospital to another, eventually came to, to one place where, you know, thankfully, the doctor did believe the story and actually, you know, decided to uh, do a proper investigation and see if he could help. I decided to throw a net out to see if I can catch one of these critters. Here we go. Ah. <laughs> this is almost exactly what Silvio described, uh, you know, something going in one direction and just not wanting to come into reverse at all. Look at that, I can actually feel its spines digging in when it does that. It was actually walking using its head. Now imagine that in an orifice. This fish is just leaking blood. It's not this fish's blood, it's something it's been feeding on. And uh, it is just an absolute nightmare, you know, a real sort of vampire fish, this thing. A fish like this may have entered Silvio in search of a blood meal, but little did it know that its mistake would result in an unprecedented medical procedure lasting two hours. Também não se conhece nada a respeito de um ataque desse peixe do que deve ser feito. Concorda? The first thought was to, a bit like um, a bit like a hook that's got a barb on it, um, actually pulling it back the way it went in is not always a good idea. He was thinking of actually sort of coming in from the side, coming in from the from the perineum, and actually trying to sort of pull the fish out head first. But he thought that because you know it had been such a long time in there, they would actually, and also the other fish were starting to rot a bit, maybe try and pull it out with the endoscope, you know, out tail first the way that it went in. The tail of the fish was about here, about an inch in. And so the head of it would have been somewhere like here. And then what happened was that the, the pincers were gradually you know, manipulated out of the hole here. There we go. 
grabbed hold of the fish just, uh, just in front of the tail, and then using the camera, and then the whole apparatus just gradually, gradually, very delicately moved out. Se aquela força é o suficiente para o peixe vir, sem cortar, sem partir, sem, sem danificar. Apparently, it wasn't necessary to pull with a, a certain amount of force, but feeling that it's not doing any, any damage. Unfortunately, you know, it did, it did come out um, eventually. The fish was sent to the National Institute of Amazonian Research to be formally identified, thus confirming, after centuries of speculation, that a fish has entered a human in the most intimate of places. This is a somewhat momentous and possibly delicate occasion. I'm bringing Silvio back to meet his fish. Uh, this one. Silvio, yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, but this is actually the first time since he had the surgery that Silvio has seen this fish, this very fish. Can I pick it up, see? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but I just asked Silvio if he, if he would like to handle it, and he, a very, uh, very definite no. I think, I think once was enough. So maybe if I leave it in my hand. But I'm, I'm quite struck by how large it is. It's big, right? No, 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 it really does sort of beg a belief that something of that size could uh, could burrow into you. It's not often you use a big fish to catch a small fish, but after just two hours, it's definitely worked. Oh, 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 oh what was that? What was that? Oh. I don't know the scientific name for all the scavengers at this gruesome picnic. The locals call these musum, or snakefish. There's actually something a bit different in there. Uh, if I can get it out, I don't really want to shove my hand in there. There, 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 there. Just hold him. There we go. So this is the Kandiru Asu. This is the fish that bores holes in the body and then devours from the inside out. And it was this fish that they retrieved from those corpses in the morgue. This, this was a heavy fish when it went in. Nothing left inside. In fact, if I, I just rip it open a little bit. The Kandirua Sioux makes no distinction between human flesh and that of any other animal floating in the Amazon. Just like a hollow case of skin with the remnants of the bone inside. This is almost exactly, you know, what the autopsy report was in the morgue, except, you know, in, in that case, we were talking about a human being. This water is obviously filled with flesh eaters, so I try and entice them to feed out of my hand. I'm actually just on somebody's house here, and I'm just dangling this fish off the side, and these kantaroo are just attacking right on the surface. And they, you know, I can see from here the way they are just literally drilling their way into that fish. It's like a crocodile death roll, and no doubt the cause of the gunshot-like entry holes in the corpses. I'm not trying to lift them out, actually. I'm not trying to try and lift them. Look at that. Hey, that's one there. And back in the water. Apparently, these things will give you a bite just like a piranha. Look at that. That's a very, very definite cut. And this is all the work of the Kandiru. The Amazon River is a scavenger's paradise. It's like an acid bath here for corpses. And again, it's members of the catfish family that are one of the principal operators cleaning up the bodies. I've seen that here in the Amazon, small catfish have a frightening ability to attack us where it hurts most, and also to dispose of our bodies. But what about the large catfish? I started this quest with a tail of a man-eater. Can they really swallow something as big as themselves? I need to resume my hunt for the biggest catfish in the Amazon, the Piraiba. But no sooner have I cast into the water when my fishing guide Flavio spots a truly graphic example of overambitious Amazon predation. Oh, look! Something that immediately reminds me of the man half swallowed by a fish. We've just 
seen this Playara floating down the river, quite a big one, still alive. We thought it was dead to start with. On investigation, it's got another one down its throat, and Flavio is just grabbing hold of the tail of it and pulling it out. Here we go. Look at that. There's the tail of another fish. So this fish almost choked to death on, on something just, you know, too big to swallow, really. If we can get the other fish out, it might survive, but as it is... Good grief! Size of that... Look at that! Just look at... The... Good grief! Look at the size of the fish that that other fish swallowed. So that's the meal, the one that's looking slightly worse for wear. And this is the, uh, the greedy one that swallowed it. This remarkable act of cannibalism is just as ambitious as the catfish that tried to swallow a man. Maybe in these murky waters, accidentally biting off more than you can chew is a common occurrence. Oh, loco! The Breeder River sharks have learnt to steal fishermen's catches from their lines, unique behaviour not recorded in bull sharks in any other river in the world, which might explain why they are so big in this river. They will actively hunt down fishing boats, lie in wait until the fishermen make a catch, and then bolt in to take an easy meal. My plan is to position myself right next to the fisherman and let the sharks come to me. Yeah, lots of activity on the river today. That's going to get the sharks quite excited. I set up seven miles up river, in a spot close to where the team landed the big female shark last year. But well away from this year's tagged shark, which was last located near the river mouth. The tracking team are out searching for him right now. Only a shark in this river runs with this power and speed. But I've got a problem. Oh, wait a minute. What's happened there? It suddenly went slack. Oh, that, no, that's round something. That's round something. Ah, that is actually snagged. I've already lost one shark to a broken line. I don't want to lose another. I can still feel the fish. If, back, if we can go back, Mark. Just get it off that snag, whatever it is. This is not good. I think we're clear. I think we're clear. Oh, that's, the line is a bit shredded there. Oh, that line is in a bad way. This shark has taken the line around some debris on the bottom. And even though it hasn't gone through, it's very badly frayed. I'm only on about, I don't know, might only be 50% strength on the line. My line is wearing through, but if I try to bring the shark in too quickly, I could lose it. I'm just so nervous because I know the line's not in a good way. One hour and one mile further upriver. A friend of mine who's caught bull sharks said to me, bull sharks will, you know, they're not like something like a Mako shark, which is a real speed merchant. A bull shark is very solid, very muscular. It'll just like take you for a walk. I feel like a, a six-year-old child taking a, a Rottweiler for a walk. It feels bigger and stronger than the other shark. It's just getting more lively all of a sudden. It's right under the bow. If we can go left, all right. OK. Three miles from where I hooked the shark, and it's still pulling the boat. People who say catching fish doesn't cause any pain, which they're wrong. My back is killing me. Not to mention where the rod butt is jammed. Oh, dear. It's going to be an interesting colour, I think, after the end of all this. As the hours pass, the shark continues to drag the boat up the river. This is totally not normal in a river. Uh, I had a giant stingray on for two hours. But we've gone past that. It must be like two and three quarters now. The fight is now heading towards its third hour. The shark has taken the boat and me four miles upriver. It might come up. It might come up. Coming towards the surface. That's a tail. That's a, that's a, that's a fish. Dorsal and tail. Dorsal and tail. First time it's broken the surface. It's going to show again. The dorsal. 
Ah, wait, it's under the boat, it's under the boat. Back, please, back, 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 back. It's the last, here we go. Right, now, absolute concentration. If I say let go, just let go, all right? Okay. The gaff is necessary to hold the head up, but it barely punctures the tough skin. Bloody hell! It's not really gaff, is it? This is going to break the gaff. It's going to break the bloody gaff. This shark has battled with me for three and a half hours and dragged the boat five miles up the river. Get to the bank, I think. You just need to get to the bank. You guys need to get off. Never had a fight anywhere like that long before. That's almost double the longest fight I had with a freshwater stingray. And those things just glue themselves to the bottom. Wow. <laughs> The gaff's now out. <laughs> this bull shark is definitely larger than the last one I caught. We'll keep it alive while the team takes samples, measure it, and insert the acoustic tag. Then get it back into the river. Sharks can't actually pump water over their gills, so uh, I'm wedging the, the mouth open with a bit of wood and just shoving water in its mouth. Yeah, it'll be... It's another male bull shark, nine feet, 10 inches long, and more than 500 pounds the biggest fish I've ever caught, and one of the largest male bull sharks ever landed. Tags are there, samples taken, parasites, all the rest of it. Very quick operation. But this thing, having been so strong for so long, is now just feeling a bit like I am. So we just need to get it, uh, get it revived. Sharks trigger a primal fear like no other. And even though it's utterly exhausted after fighting with me for nearly four hours, this bull shark can still prompt a nervous run for land. <laughs> Two catches, proving that last year's shark was not a fluke and that the Breeda River is home to some of the largest bull sharks anywhere in the world. I'm now weeks into my trip to catch a Goliath tigerfish, what the Congolese call Mbenga. I've tried everything in my power, but the fish is proving unbelievably elusive. So I've decided to call on a higher level of help and pay a visit to the village witch doctor. The people of Central Africa hold fetishers like this man in very high regard. His knowledge has been passed down over generations and his powers lie in his ability to call on the spirits. He uses substances from the forest to create the potions. I have no idea what this will involve, but for a small payment, I'm hoping he can change my fortunes. What he's asking for is success in the fishing, but also protection from the fish. This is, this is a dangerous fish. I'm going to try and get one of these fish and actually put it back alive, but that does actually carry something of a risk. It's sort of a lucky, a lucky charm, and I'm, I'm thinking that I'm going to need all the help I get in the next few days. The ceremony finishes with the villagers thanking the spirits.
Fred explains to me in more detail exactly what the witch doctor said. C'est bon. C'est bon. C'est bon. C'est bon. He has consulted a spirit of a dead fisherman, and he has said that the place to catch the fish is to come all the way up here from the village and then work down. Fish on! Red, the net! Okay, I've got to just get a keep pressure from above because there's rocks. And I've got It's gonna jump, it's gonna jump. That's the float, gonna see the fish very soon. Gonna see the fish very soon. There it is, that's a good fish! Look at that! The net, the net, the net! Careful, Fred, careful, careful, careful! Right, we want to be very careful now. Ready, the net. We want to get the head in. La tête, la tête. Oh, segure le poisson. Bon! I got it. At last, I've got my Goliath tigerfish. Right now, just a moment. Is there anything in this or not? I put it in this morning. It was under my pillow. Like the fetisher said, it was under my pillow. Today, I took it with me fishing. Now I want to do something that fishermen never do when they catch one of these monsters. Have a look at it, then release it alive back into the river. The mouth is going. The fish is breathing. That's good. And the gills are going. That's, that's good. This water is nicely aerated, that's a good thing as well. Now, ah, those teeth! That will just take lumps out of other fish, it will take lumps out of crocodiles even, and there are stories well documented of that taking lumps out of people. Wow, there we go. Oof. What a freshwater monster this thing is. What I'm looking at here is the ultimate piranha. Those teeth, just like a piranha's, triangular, sharp blades down the side, and they interlock. They, they, they interlock almost like scissors. They will just cut a lump out. Two big differences, though. One is piranhas hunt in packs. You know, this is a solitary hunter. And the other thing is the size. People who think that piranhas are scary, if they saw one of these things, I think their nightmares might be populated by a slightly different animal. One sort of diabolical anatomical detail on this fish is that it hasn't just got one hinge on its jaw, it's got a double hinge. It's got one hinge here, it's got another hinge there, which enables it to open that jaw much, much wider. So it can almost open like that and just come straight in and take a really huge bite out of its prey. I found a witness named Carmelo who bravely tried to save him and was himself bitten in the process. But with almost 40 species of true piranha, which one is the culprit? Do you know what type of piranha they were here? He says they were brightly coloured, red, and he indicated the belly and the flanks, and there's a very clear, positive ID. Those are red-bellied piranhas. This wasn't what I was expecting to hear. Carmelo's testimony is the first time I've heard an eyewitness describe an adult human being targeted and killed by red-bellied piranhas. It's an unprecedented event and runs counter to experiments I've conducted showing that red bellies won't normally attack people or large animals. That they're not the monsters that B-movies would have us believe they are. So is this just a freak event? 
Or is something bigger going on here? Carmelo says that Oscar's is not the only attack he's come across on the river. Piranhas struck near a riverside ranch very recently. If I hurry, I might make it there before nightfall. It seems that Oscar's attack was not a once and done incident. We just make the ranch by dusk, and the conversation soon turns to attacks. Culebra, a laborer, tells me that the attack Carmelo heard about happened only six months ago. This time, it wasn't on a human, but something larger and much more powerful. Three cowboys found a horse from a neighboring ranch that had swum across the river onto their land. They got it back into the water to return it. It was literally just a few feet away from the bank and the piranhas attacked it. And as soon as it started bleeding, more and more piranhas came. The cowboys desperately tried to recover the horse. But just the time that it took them to do that, uh, the animal was dead. Not only that, it had been hollowed out by the fish. And when they managed to get the body of the horse out of the water, there was apparently just a stream of piranhas falling out of a hole in its skin. It was that quick that it happened. I'm in Bolivia, trying to hunt down a giant predator that's invading these remote jungles. An underwater intruder that might somehow have changed the behavior of local piranhas making them attack humans who they used to live peacefully alongside. And there's something on the end of the line. Yeah, that's a fish, that's a fish. That's good size as well. Gary tells me this is the mystery fish he brought me here to find. I might just glove this. <laughs> And it's one I've met before. Hi. So there we go. This is an arapaima. This is a fish I was never expecting to catch here. Arapaima shouldn't be in Bolivia. They're not native to these waters. But their presence here could explain the gory attacks that happened on the Rio Yata. Arapaima are formidable predators, and one fish is a favorite meal, piranhas. If these waters are riddled with arapaima, they could be nailing the piranhas, picking off the slower, weaker ones and leaving the stronger and more aggressive fish. And if they're competing for the same food as well, Perhaps this has forced the piranhas to become much more aggressive. This is a young arapaima, and to me, that makes it even more significant. It means the arapaima haven't just invaded, but they're breeding here. How many more are out there? How bad has this invasion become? We need to check the lines. As we pull them in, it becomes clear. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah. Here we go. There's a fish. They're here in force. These fish, given the right conditions, warm water, they don't need a lot of oxygen, they can absolutely take over. So once the genie's out of the bottle, you know, there's no putting it back. These things, they're here to stay. And I know only too well how big they can grow. You can see the fish. Dominating the waters they live in. Massive female arapaima. In the case of what happened on the Rio Yatta that day, I see now all the possible 
pieces of the jigsaw. Maybe this is what caused Oscar's death, not the direct cause, but one of the factors that upset the balance. And pushed the piranhas into becoming more aggressive, attacking anything and anyone. I found a crucial witness who has finally shed light on a brutal killing. He's seen a second body with the same bruising injuries that I'm investigating. But this body also had bite marks, which he says identifies the culprit. Do you know what animal may have done this? Sucuri. Anaconda. Anacondas killing humans is unprecedented. There have never been any confirmed cases. If these human deaths really are the work of anacondas, that's a huge revelation. But the extensive bruising and broken bones that I've heard about are entirely consistent with the anaconda's MO for killing prey squeezing the life out of it. The anaconda is a water-dwelling monster with which I've had little experience. But is this animal also the cause of the disappearances around here? I need to have a close look at this highly secretive predator. The Formoso River in southern Brazil is where I'm looking for an anaconda big enough to swallow a man. My plan is to leave the shore and go beneath the surface. I'll be out of my element and more likely to stumble into something at very close range. So I'm carrying a knife. The important thing about this is the point. Uh, if you actually get that into the inside of a coil, that will stop it exerting that lethal pressure. My boat driver is Zhuka. He knows the river well. We arrive at a good spot for me to get in the water. I'm now in the anaconda's domain, and immediately I feel vulnerable. All I have to do now is find a monster. If I run into trouble down here, my only connection to the surface is the radio link in my mask. Recent rains have stirred up the water. Visibility is down to just a couple of yards, and the current has become dangerously fast. Well, the only way I'm managing to hold position at the moment is actually hanging onto this rock here. And if I wanted to go upstream, there's just no way I'd make any headway without pulling myself along. If I come across an anaconda in these conditions, as things are, I'm probably going to blunder into it. In this murk, my heart is racing. Down here, there's nowhere for me to hide. I could be grabbed from any direction at any moment. I can't see it. It's possible it might see me, though. Suddenly, I see something appear out of the gloom. There's something coming towards me. It's here. It's coming down. It's coming out. With just a few feet of visibility, the only camera that picks it up is the one fixed to my tank. I'm right next to it. I'm right next to it. I'm with it. I'm with the snake. 
Fighting against the current, I'm only able to stay with it for a few seconds. Then, it simply vanishes. Oh, I might have lost it. I think we've lost it. It can just vanish in a matter of seconds. So it was just a very short, intense experience. I've seen an anaconda now in its own environment. Very, very creepy feeling encountering a snake underwater. That anaconda was about the same length as the one I caught on the soccer field. A 12-footer is a good start, but I know there are giants here. I've got to head even deeper into the anaconda's territory. This river is my one chance for seeing with my own eyes an anaconda of man-eating proportions and establishing whether anacondas could have been responsible for the bruised corpses and mysterious disappearances around Porto de Morris. I get back in the water, in a place where Juca recently spotted something huge. I scan both banks for anything that resembles an anaconda. The last thing I want to do is startle one and provoke an attack. Rounding a bend, there's a cloud of silt. and everything I'd hoped for and feared is suddenly there, right in front of me. Look at the size of this! I've stumbled into a potential man-eater. It's gotta be a good 20 foot long, three times the length of me. And weighing at least 200 pounds. It's a monstrous beast. With a frightening girth. It is huge, it is absolutely huge. A bruiser like this can go without eating for six months, by which time it's worked up a man-sized appetite. And what they do is they lurk underwater in ambush. It's terrifying being this close to an anaconda that could seize me in a flash and then crush me to death. But only by getting up close can I grasp the true scale of this beast. And I can all too easily imagine those jaws working their way around my head, while those massive coils dislocate my shoulders so the rest of me will slip down. I'm looking it in the eye. Actually, one this size could swallow an adult human. After seeing this giant, I'm in no doubt that people are potentially on the menu. And that as well as causing the two grisly deaths, anacondas could also have been responsible for the mysterious disappearances around Porto de Morge. This has to be one of the most incredible encounters of my life. Anacondas are lurking beneath the surface all over the Amazon, waiting to strike. And I believe they could be responsible for other unsolved disappearances right across this region. But by destroying the evidence, this river monster is covering its tracks. I'm in the Florida Keys, planning to dive with Barracuda. I'm hoping if I can see how they behave, I can figure out how to catch a big one. I put on chainmail gloves, protection against a fish that shows no fear and that is literally armed to the teeth. Then I head down with a bucket of bait to draw in the fish that Barracuda eat. 
and start chumming the water, wondering what is lurking out there. Vibration and movement in the water is definitely calling in the predators. And there's one here. Does it intend to attack my bait or me? There's, a, there's one out here. Here's my bait. Here's my rod. Normally I've got a reel and some line. Today I've just got the bait attached to the rod. A vigorous waving of the bait seems to get its attention. Here we go. are definitely coming in. There's definitely a sort of a cautious um, approach going on. This fish is wary, assessing the danger before striking. That came in at a rate of knots. It just locked on and it was coming at speed. Just fearsome, absolutely fearsome, these things. Just a little, little rain of scales in the water. I'm really getting an understanding of how they lock on and how they attack. Barracuda, it hits, and it hits straight on. It's not like a sideways movement like you get with some fish, like sharks. Didn't take the bait, it just sliced the end clean off. Whew. I didn't, I scarcely even saw it. That's what must have happened to Bill's foot. For a moment there, I wasn't looking at a fish getting nailed, I was looking at a human foot, and I can absolutely imagine now what must have been going on underneath the water when Bill got attacked. learned so much about barracuda just seeing them feed right in front of me i can certainly now visualize much better what's going on out of sight under the surface now it's time to put this experience into practice with rod and line first cast and there's something big on my line where is it where's it where's the line where's the line there it is there it is there it is there's the fish. With that, exactly. So. Oh, this fish has still got so much strength. Um, first cast straight away on this deep wreck, so it just goes to show more water over their heads just how much uh, more confident they are. Those teeth are just unbelievable. I'm very careful to stay clear of this fish's jaws. Nice sized fish, um, but I think what I really want to do is get this back. I'm after a big one. Get this back, get another bait out, see if we can get one uh, that might even have this one for dinner. Size matters. I'm here to prove that Barracuda not only have the equipment, but also the sheer weight and power to commit the attacks I'm investigating. I quickly hook another. And another, even bigger. You know, everything stabs and everything cuts. If you're on the receiving end of that, very, very bad news. Okay. 
The barracuda just keep on coming, each one bigger than the last. Uh, fast and furious action. I feel like I'm casting into the pack of barracuda I saw while diving. Oh. There's a better size one. Here we go. Oh. Um, just one after the other, these fish. And look at the size. It's not just about individual big fish. These are all um, serious size fish. And they seem to pack more or less in fish of a similar size. Then a different kind of take and definitely a bigger fish. Is it that I've got my line past the marauding pack and down to the big barracuda below? This feels more of a weight than a, than a speed merchant. Um, it was going deep, which had me a bit worried. Uh, gonna see the fish in a sec. Gonna see the fish, it's a grouper. Groupers are predators that normally stay deep. This one must have been drawn up by all the feeding activity above. Um, accidental catch, it wasn't after these, but it just goes to show how many predators hang around um, a wreck like this. They suck in and engulf prey just by opening that massive mouth. Whew. For a moment, I thought it was a very sizable barracuda. Then, something nearly pulls the rod out of my hands. This one feels bigger still. Could it finally be the big barracuda that's been eluding me? Uh, this feels like good-sized fish. Uh, I, I'm guessing it's about 30 foot down. Uh, and I'm struggling to bring it any nearer to the surface. It's still hanging. You can see the leader, so there's the fish. There's the fish. There it is. It's the proof I needed to see with my own eyes. A huge barracuda. Uh, size of this. Uh, it's been... Uh, I've been thinking I've been catching big ones, one after another after another, and uh, along comes this. No, those aren't big ones. This is a big one. It, it's just unbelievable. The teeth, the power, the streamlining. Uh, this would absolutely lacerate a limb, and I reckon one like this, um, at speed, out of the water, hit you in the side. <sighs> Perfectly possible this could break your ribs. Uh, it's a tired fish as well. I want to get it back in the water. I came to Florida in search of a creature capable of inflicting life-threatening injuries. And it wasn't the shark that most would assume, but another of the ocean's super predators. I'm on the water with Indonesian sea gypsies to find out if bright lights at night can turn the mysterious sorry fish into a lethal leaping spear. There, 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 there. Yeah, I'm seeing stuff in the distance. There are small fish jumping out of the water when the, when the light hits. Fish are reacting to the light, but they're heading away, not towards me. That's like sort of a panic reaction, I think. When fish are alarmed, they just take off, and sometimes that takes them out of the water. But then I see something bigger. Something there, there was something there jumped. There was an arc, and it was about six foot between where it came out of the water and where it went back in. It was a long, slender, leaping fish. And it fits the description of the sorry fish, held responsible for the deadly attacks here. But I got my first sighting of the fish that appears to be responsible for the deaths and injuries here. And it could be the culprit in the case of the stabbed snorkeler. But I'm left with one nagging question. How does a fish reacting to lantern light at night connect to an attack that happened in broad daylight? Back 
back on the main island, there's been a development. Word has gotten out to the family of the snorkeling victim, and they've invited me to join them at a local restaurant. Lena Hermawan was 39, and the mother of two young boys. Her husband, Benny, and his cousin, Thurley, were both at the beach the day Lena was attacked. I've been walking about 20 meters, when I heard people screaming at, at my back. I turned around and saw my wife being carried by a man. Thurley tells me she was actually in the water with Lena when the tragedy happened. After several hours snorkeling together, they were finally heading back towards the shore. Suddenly, two fish leapt clear of the water. One narrowly missed the women. The other struck Lena in the face. The fish got through the, the eye. It's blood anywhere, everywhere. Everywhere is blood. Many, many blood. Then Benny shows me an item from the scene that he thinks might interest me. Lena's necklace and earrings. So she was wearing this yes. uh, at the time? This is potentially a vital clue. The missing link between night and day. As sunlight sparkled off this jewellery, did it provoke a reaction from the fish, just as my flashlight did? I remember a story in Botswana where a tigerfish was attracted by the shiny crucifix around a man's neck. It's possible the fish that impaled Lena was reacting in the same way, mistaking flashes of light from her jewellery for potential prey. If you're a predator, you strike first and ask questions later. According to her husband, the attack happened at five o'clock in the afternoon. Reef fish can be habitual feeders, so I'm returning to the beach at the same time of day to see if I can find this coral killer. My underwater camera captures a streamlined fish with a dagger-like snout and a mouth full of teeth. This looks like the fish I saw out on the Sampella Reef, the fish the sea gypsies call sorry. In the daylight, I can see that it's what I know as a needlefish. And it's clearly at home here, on the reef where the snorkeler was struck. The predatory needlefish can grow to five feet long and those elongated jaws hold as many as 200 teeth. When closed, its jaws form a rigid and sharp point, like the end of a dagger. It's easy to imagine the damage this fish could do, traveling at its top speed of 40 miles an hour. I could be looking at Lena's killer. What the locals do for this fish is they use this. It's just a piece of uh, rope that's been unpicked. Something like a needlefish, lots of small teeth, comes along, chomps onto that, and those teeth just get tangled up in all those strands. Eventually, something strikes. OK, stop, 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 stop. There's one on here, there's one on here. Taking it very, very gently. It's secured only by a tangle of fibres, so bringing this fish in is a delicate operation. I'm relying purely on tangle, not on hook hold. This is a completely different way of playing a fish. Just keeping enough tension. That's a needlefish. I can finally take a good look at this fish's lethal business end. 
Well, I've seen these in the water, but to see this um, close up is really something very different. Holding this needlefish with its large, light-sensitive eyes, it's easy to imagine how it could have been drawn to Lena's jewellery and startled by the Sampella fisherman's lanterns. But I can't take my eyes off that long, sharp jaw. If you're a small fish, then the, the weapons you have to worry about are, the, are those needle-sharp teeth. But if you're a person, uh, like the snorkeler uh, in the water, then it's not so much those teeth, it's the whole snout that becomes the weapon. And you just have a very, very small point on the end. And even something that size moving at speed through the water, that, that is almost like a dagger. And there are numerous places in the body where if, if that went in just a couple of inches, that could be fatal. For me, this case is finally closed. The end of one of my most unusual investigations. Normally, when I'm looking for a fish that can kill a person, I'm looking for something big. But not always. Sometimes small is deadly.